Gresham College presents Shaping Modern Mathematics, Polynomials and Their Roots by Professor Raymond Flood, Gresham Professor of Geometry. Well, again, um, this is the second of my series of lectures this academic year on shaping modern mathematics. And last time I considered analysis. And for those of you who were here last time, I'm very pleased to see that you've returned. And this week it's going to be algebra. So let me say, first of all, what uh, the words in my title mean. Well, a polynomial and roots. So polynomial, first of all. Polynomial is an expression in a variable which we usually write as x, in which various powers of x can occur multiplied by numbers and added and subtracted together. The highest power of x occurring is called the degree of the polynomial. And like many things, it's much better if you can see examples of it to help reinforce the definition. And I also want to do this just to introduce some of the terms that I'll be using as I go through the lecture. So examples of polynomials are 2x minus 6, a polynomial of degree 1, or linear. And x squared minus 8x plus 15, a polynomial of degree 2, or or quadratic. Then x cubed plus 18x squared plus 10x minus 29, a polynomial of degree 3, or cubic. And x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x squared plus 2x plus 1, a polynomial of degree 4, or a quartic. And x to the fifth plus 5x to the fourth plus 10x cubed plus 10x squared plus 5x plus 1, a polynomial of degree 5, or quintic. And I'm not going to keep on going like this for the full r, but <laughs> you can imagine the pattern and so on for degree 6, 7, 8, as far as you wish to go. Now, another definition... The numbers appearing in the polynomial are called the coefficients. Um, So for the cubic example there, the coefficients are 1, 18, 10 and minus 29. They tell you how many there are of the different powers of x. And what is the constant term? For the quintic example, the coefficients are 1, 5, 10, 10, 5 and 1. Now, for the other term in my lecture title, what are the roots of the polynomial? And... I always use that in the technical sense, I'll explain in a moment, but also that in my lecture I'll go back a little bit in history to try and explain some of the background. So the roots of the polynomial are just simply the values of x which make it equal to zero. In the linear example, this means solving the equation 2x minus 6 equals zero. And that's a good solution, x equals 3. So the root of the linear polynomial 2x minus 6 is 3. For the quadratic polynomial, the roots will be obtained by finding those values of x which make x squared minus 8x plus 15 equal to 0. And I can identify two roots. One is 3, because 3 squared minus 8 times 3 plus 15 is 9 minus 24 plus 15, and that is 0. And another is 5, because 5 squared minus 8 times 5 plus 15 is also 0. That's 25 minus 40 plus 15 equals 0. Well, now that we know what the words in the lecture title mean, I can tell you what the lecture is going to be about. (laughs) It's about a hunt. It's a hunt to find a formula for the roots of a polynomial, any polynomial, from its coefficients using the four basic arithmetic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and extracting roots. For example, square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, etc. Now, we can do this for a quadratic equation. You might be familiar with, or at least remember meeting, the formula for finding the roots of a quadratic equation, an equation where the highest power of the unknown is 2. And I've written a general quadratic down there with coefficients a, b and c. And one of the roots is given by the expression minus b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And the other by minus b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And the way that I learnt it, the way I was taught it was x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. But look at the form of the solution. The form of the solution only involves the coefficients of the equation, and in this case, addition, subtraction, division, yeah, multiplication, because we've got 4ac, and taking square roots. 
So we're able to find a formula that will solve every quadratic equation in terms of the four basic arithmetic operations, and in this case, taking square roots. So for an example, just to reinforce that, so in case you're, it's a while since you've used the formula for solving a quadratic. In the case of x squared minus 8x plus 15 equal to 0, you identify the coefficients, a is equal to 1, b is equal to minus 8, c is equal to 15. And then you plug it in and essentially stop thinking. You have the minus b becomes 8, and then plus or minus that term under the square root sign, which is minus 8 squared minus 4 times 1 times 15. Simplify that out. 8 plus or minus the square root of 64 minus 60, all of which is divided by 2. And then you get that 8 plus or minus 2. So if you take the plus sign, you get 8 plus 2 giving you 10 divided by 2, which is 5. If you take the minus sign, 8 minus 2 giving you 6 divided by 2 gives you the 3. And if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, as I was marking to some of the audience when we were waiting to come in, you can get so involved with getting the square roots right that you can actually make a mistake in the arithmetic. But fortunately, I noticed it before I gave the presentation. <laughs> At least I hope there are no other mistakes. <laughs> so this formula works for all quadratic equations. And the quest for a similar formula for polynomial equations where the highest power is 3, 4, 5 or more led to dramatic changes in how the question was regarded and indeed was crucial in the creation of modern algebra, in the shaping of modern algebra. It turns out that there is a formula for cubics and there is a formula for quartics, but there's none for quintics and higher degree polynomials. This is an amazing result with major consequences. So let me give that overview of the rest of the lecture. So I'm in blue at the top, I've given the core problem, the problem, the hunt that we are looking for, a formula, just to bring that to the top of the screen. And what I'm going to do is to briefly show that finding the solution of what we call quadratic equations goes back to the Mesopotamians. Then Islamic mathematicians looked at equa equations geometrically and made the first serious attempt on some cubic equations. And finally, we come to one of the most notorious and exciting stories in the history of mathematics, when in 16th century Italy, formulae were discovered for the cubic and for the quartic, that is polynomials of degree three and four. After this, mathematicians tried to find formulae for polynomials of degree five or higher without success because, as I said, it turns out to be impossible. This result is a 19th century story, and I want to pick out three themes. First of all, polynomial equations do have roots. If we're going to seek a formula for the roots of a polynomial equation, it would be reassuring to know that it has a solution. And it was the great, great Carl Frederick Gauss who showed that they do. This is called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. In my last lecture, I talked about the fundamental theorem of the calculus, and in my lecture after Christmas, I will talk about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Today, it's the fundamental theorem of algebra. So polynomial equations do have roots. Then we look at the work of Abel and Galois, two mathematicians who died tragically young. They showed that it was impossible to find a general formula for solving polynomial equations of degree greater than four that is, quintics and higher degree polynomials. A crucial to this story are complex or imaginary numbers. They arise naturally in solving polynomial equations, and I want to show you how to remove the mystery that is sometimes associated with them. So let's start with Mesopotamian or Babylonian mathematics. It developed over some 3,000 years and over a wide region. And the word Mesopotamian, or Babylonian, comes from the Greek. The Mesopotamian comes from the Greek for between the rivers. It refers to an area between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in modern-day Iraq. And using a wedge-shaped stylus, the Mesopotamians imprinted their symbols into moist clay. This is called cuneiform writing. And the tablet was then left to harden in the sun. Many thousands of mathematical clay tablets have survived. 
Now, we write numbers in the decimal place value system based on 10 with separate columns for units, tens, hundreds, etc. as we move from right to left. Each place has value 10 times the next. The Mesopotamians also used a place value system, but it was a sexagesimal system based on 60. Each place had value 60 times the next. Remnants of the sexagesimal system survive in our measurements of time, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and of angles. There were essentially three types of mathematical clay tablets. Some of them list tables of numbers for use in calculations and are called table tablets. And on the right hand side of the slide is a drawing of a table tablet showing the nine times tables. Other clay tablets called problem tablets posed and solved mathematical problems. A third type may be described as rough work created by students while learning. The problem I want to show you dates from the old Babylonian period from between 1800 and 1600 BC and is from a clay tablet in the British Museum. The catalogue number is BM 13901 and it gives a series of steps or recipe for solving a particular problem of a type that we would now call a quadratic equation. It does this essentially using the method I showed you earlier, the formula, but in the context of a particular problem. And in our notation, the problem on the tablet gives an algorithm for solving x squared plus 1x equals 3 quarters. And similar algorithmic approaches can be found in ancient Egyptian texts around the same time. An important source for these problems is the Rhine papyrus, dating from 1650 BC and believed to be copied from a text that is 150 years older. It is also in the British Museum. Now, unlike the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, the Greeks were more concerned with proving things, particularly in arithmetic and in geometry, than with such algebraic pursuits as solving equations. But there was a strand of Greek mathematics that was not so constrained by geometry, and that was in the work of Diophantus, who has been called the father of algebra. He probably lived in the 3rd century AD. We know very little about his life. His main contributions to mathematics were the 13 books that comprise his Arithmetica, not all of which survive. Unlike the geometrical writings of most Greek mathematicians, this was a collection of algebraic problems that were posed and solved. Diophantus was also the first mathematician to devise and to employ algebraic symbols. Diophantus did not present general methods for solving his problems, but often chose a particular example and found the result in that case alone. The following solution is adapted from his Arithmetica. Define two numbers such that their sum and product are given numbers. So define two numbers whose sum is 20 and whose product is 96. And he does this nice little trick where he takes 2x to be the difference between the numbers so that therefore you can write the numbers as 10 plus x and 10 minus x. So their sum is going to be 20. 10 plus x added on to 10 minus x. And then the other condition is, we've already used the condition that their sum is 20, the other condition is that their product is going to be 96. But if you multiply 10 plus x by 10 minus x, you get 100 minus x squared, and you don't actually need the formula, hopefully, or a calculator in order to find that the answer an answer is 2. So the numbers are 12 and 8. 12 plus 8 gives you 20, and 12 times 8 gives you 96. When Diophantus' work was introduced into the Latin West in the 16th century, it was to be very influential in mathematicians who were still thinking in terms of geometry with its attendant constraints. Crucial to this transmission of Diophantus' work and indeed that of other Greek mathematicians, was the work of Islamic mathematicians, translators and commentators, who worked over a period of 700 years from the 8th to the 15th century. They made significant contributions to algebra and geometry. In particular, they studied quadratic and cubic equations, and I want to draw your attention to the work of two of these Islamic mathematicians. One of the earliest scholars at the House of Wisdom 
established in the early 9th century in Baghdad by Caliph Harun al-Rashid and his son, was the Persian scholar Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. The author of two celebrated astronomical star tables and an influential treatise on the astrolabe, he's remembered by mathematicians primarily for his book on arithmetic and algebra. His arithmetic was important for introducing the Indian number system to the Arab world, to the Islamic world, and later helping to spread the decimal counting system throughout Christian Europe. Indeed, his Arabic name, transmuted into algorithm, was later used in Europe to mean arithmetic. And we still use the word algorithm to refer to a step-by-step -step procedure for solving problems. The title of his algebra book, Kitab al-Jabr wal Mukabala, um, the compendious book on calculation by completion, algebra, and reduction, al Mukabala, and the book title is the origin of our word algebra. You can see it as the second word in the title. And the word algebra refers to the operation of transposing a term from one side of an algebraic equation to the other. al khwarizmis algebra commences with a lengthy account of how to solve linear equations with numbers and terms involving x and quadratic equations, so involving x squared. Now, since negative numbers were still not considered meaningful, that meant that he had to split the equations into six different types, given here with their modern equivalents. Um, all the numbers have to be positive, which is why you need the six types in order to describe them. Um, roots equal to numbers, ax equal to b, squares equal to numbers, ax squared equals b, squares equal to roots, ax squared equals bx. So you can see that you're going to have to, if you think about it for a while, have to have six of them when everything is positive. Squares and roots equal to numbers, ax squared plus bx equals c, and then the other permutation, squares and numbers equal to roots, and roots and numbers equal to squares. He then proceeded to solve instances of each type, such as x squared plus 10x equals 39, using a geometrical form of completing the square. So for this and the next few slides is when you have to be alert. So I'm going to do in this and the next few slides solving the quadratic equation in two ways, geometrically, completing the square, and then the corresponding way of writing that out algebraically, and then I want to draw a conclusion from the two ways. So here we have the equation x squared plus 10x is equal to 39. And to solve this, if you look at the top left-hand corner of the big square, if you look at this one here, we have a square of side x, and then he constructs two rectangles, one of side x and the other side 5, again x and 5. So we've got two rectangles, and then he completes the square. He puts in a square of side 5 to obtain a large square of side x x plus 5. So the completing of the square refers to putting in this here. So then, as I say, the resulting larger square of side x plus 5 has area x plus 5 all squared and is made up from two smaller squares with area x squared and 25 and two rectangles, each with side 5x. And that's just writing that out algebraically. But now we know that the equation we want to solve says that the x squared plus 10x is equal to 39. So we're able to put 39 in here for the x squared plus 10x, and you get that x plus 5 all squared is equal to 64. Now, crucial to what will come later on, and I'll refer to, is that this procedure has essentially converted this quadratic equation into a linear equation because you can take the square root of both sides and you get that x plus 5 is equal to plus or minus 8. But the thing is, you're converting the quadratic by the method of completing the square into a linear equation. You've got a reduction of the degree. It turns out, without spoiling the story too much, that that's exactly what allows you to solve the cubic, that's exactly what allows you to solve the quartic, that's what you cannot do to solve the quintic, to drop the degree of the equation down. So let me show you the analogue of this, because if you haven't seen how to get the formula for solving 
uh, algebraically a quadratic equation, you should for once in your life. And if you've seen it before, perhaps you could just close your eyes. So we've got here the ax squared plus bx plus c equals naught. And I want to do the similar kind of thing, which is writing it as a square term of a linear, what will turn out to be a linear equation. So if you do the algebraic manipulation, one can see that the ax squared plus bx plus c can be written here, messy, messy perhaps, but well, the way I want you to look at it is that this is the square of a linear term. This is just a number, depending upon the values of a, b and c, and of course c is just a number. But you see, this is the core. To complete the square, you're writing it, sorry, the button for, the, um, for doing the slides is just below the one for uh, using the pointer. So we got as far as that. Now you can almost go on automatic pilot as a matter of algebraic manipulation after that. That really is the core thing to have. So I've gone through it a step at a time. So that we, this equation now here, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, we know that that could be written as this. This can be equal to zero, and we rearrange the terms. So I just do this transposition. I do the algebra. I transfer term from one side of the equation to another. And now I'm going to do the dividing by a. And that's relatively straightforward there. Now, this is the core of, and it's easily obscured when you see so many, the scab of symbols that we have upon the screen. But the essence is now that we're down to the square of a linear equation. So we take the square root of that now, and that means only thing involving x is on the left-hand side, x plus b over 2a is plus or minus the square root of the right-hand side. Now you do algebra again. You transfer one term to the other side in the original meaning of the word algebra. And one obtains, after rearranging so that it ends up looking respectable, x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So, cool thing to take out of it apart from the details, as I say, is the fact that what you're doing is you're dropping down from a quadratic to a linear equation. Let's turn to my other Islamic mathematician, Omar Khayyam. The Persian poet, Omar Khayyam, remembered mainly for his collection of poems called the Rubiat, was also a mathematician who wrote an algebra, geometry, and the calendar, and in fact will probably be figuring in my next lecture in geometry. In his writings on algebra, Omar Khayyam presented the first systematic classification of cubic equations, those involving x cubed, similar to Al-Khwarizmi's classification of linear and quadratic equations, and I didn't think I would inflict another long list on you. Um, he also presented a geometric method of solving several types of cubic equations. Now so here we have a cubic equation, x cubed, plus 16x equals 40, that's in modern notation, it's a solid cube, x cubed, plus edges, 16 of them, equal to a number. And the way that he goes about solving it, very cleverly, um, in our terms what he does essentially is to divide across by an x, and he turns that into finding the, points of in the point of intersection of a semicircle, this is a circle, and a particular parabola. So the parabola is here, x squared equals the square root of 16 times y, and the semicircle x squared plus y squared is 40 over 16 times x. And I've kept the numbers as 40 over 16 and the square root of 16, so that you can see, by analogy, what you would do if I replace 16 by c and 40 by d. And that technique works generally. And where they intersect, in fact, is the point x equals 2. al khwarizmi and Khayyam's work was not known in the West until much later. The same was true of the work of Indian mathematicians who had also solved quadratic equations. But I now want to move the scene to Western Europe. Johann Gutenberg's invention of the printing press around 1440 revolutionised mathematics and many other things, enabling classical mathematical works to be accessible for the first time. Previously scholarly works, such as the classical text of Euclid and Archimedes, have been available only to scholars in manuscript form. 
but the printed versions made these works much more widely available, just as the internet does today. Of particular importance to our story was an important and influential vernacular text, first published in 1494 by Luca Pacioli, a mathematics teacher and Franciscan friar. It was, in the title and translation, was Summary of Arithmetic, Geometry, Proportion and Proportionality. It's a 600-page compilation of the mathematics known at the time, written in Italian for his students. Now remembered mainly um, for including the first published account of double-entry bookkeeping, with the result that Pacioli is sometimes called the father of accounting. Now there's a title to have. However, it also highlighted a key problem. Is there a formula to solve cubic equations and can it be justified geometrically as for the quadratic? That was why I inflicted the two approaches in solving the quadratic equation on you, the geometrical one of completing the square and the algebraic one which parallels it. So you could see how the geometry could justify the algebra. So could a formula to solve cubic equations be found and could it be justified geometrically? We've seen how Omar Khayyam classified cubic equations and solved one by intersecting a semicircle with a parabola. But little further progress was made on solving cubic equations in general, and even around 1500, Pacioli and others were pessimistic as to whether this could be done or not. Now, the attempt to solve cubic equations is one of the most celebrated stories in the history of mathematics, and is really slightly bizarre. It took place in Bologna in the early 16th century, during a period when Italian university academics had little job security. I think I could take out Italian from that sentence. Having to compete annually for their positions, they often had to prove their superiority over their rivals by resorting to public problem-solving contests. Let's introduce some of the characters. In the 1520s, Scipione del Ferro, a mathematics lecturer at the University of Bologna, found a general method of solving cubic equations of the form a cube and things equal to numbers, which we would write as x cubed plus cx equals d, and revealed it to his pupil Antonio Fior. Another who investigated cubic equations around the time was Niccolo, um, known as Tartaglia, the stammerer from a bad stammer that he developed after being slashed by a sword across the face when young. In, pic in particular, Tartaglia found a method of solving equations of the form a cube and squares equal to numbers, which we would write as x cubed plus bx squared equals d. After Del Ferro's death in 1526, Fior felt free to exploit a secret and challenged Tartaglia to a cubic solving contest. Fior presented him with 30 cubic equations of the first form, giving him a month to solve them. Tartaglia in turn presented Fior with 30 cubic equations of the second form. Fior lost the contest. I like to say that Fior had placed all his eggs in the one cubic basket. Fior was not a good enough mathematician to solve Tartaglia's type of problem, where Tartaglia, during a sleepless night, 10 days before the contest, managed to discover a method for solving all of Fior's problems. The essence of Tartaglia's method was to reduce the cubics he had to solve to solving a quadratic by an appropriate substitution, first of all getting rid of the quadratic term, and then reducing it to a quadratic equation. And of course he knew how to solve the quadratic equation, as everybody here does now. Meanwhile in Milan, Girolamo Cardano was writing extensively about a range of topics from physics and medicine to algebra and probability, especially its applications to gambling. On hearing about the contest, Cardano determined to prize Tartaglia's method out of him. This he did one evening in 1539 after promising Tartaglia an introduction to the Spanish governor of the city. Tartaglia hoped that the governor would fund his researches and in turn extracted from Cardano the following solemn oath not to reveal his method of solution. As I say, it's all rather bizarre. I swear to you by God's holy gospels and as a true man of honour, not only never to publish your discoveries if you teach me them, but I also promise you and I pledge my faith as a true Christian to note them down in code 
so that after my death, no one will be able to understand them. Very strange. However, in 1542, Cardano learned that the original discovery of Tertullius' method had been due to Del Ferro, and he felt free to bake his oath. And meanwhile, his brilliant colleague, Ferrari, had found a similar general method for solving quartic equations involving terms in x to the 4. How did he do it? You probably know. He reduced the quartic down to solving a cubic, and they knew how to solve the cubic. Cardano published his Ars Magna, the great art, containing the methods for solving cubics and quartics and giving credit to Tertullia. The Ars Magna became one of the most important algebra books of all time, but Tertullia was outraged by Cardano's behaviour and spent the rest of his life writing in angry letters. <laughs> Thus, after a struggle lasting many centuries, cubic equations had at last been solved, together with quartic equations. But I just want to draw one more thing out of you that's on the quote on the board. In the Ars Magna, Cardano presented, on the board in the slide, I mean, presented geometric justifications for solving the various cases of the cubic, essentially completing the cube in the same way that we've seen completing the square. But he did not geometrically justify Ferrari's algorithms for solving the quartic, remarking. All those matters up to and including the cubic are fully demonstrated, but the others which we will add, either by necessity or out of curiosity, we do not go beyond barely setting out. No geometrical justification for solving the quartic. And here I suggest we find algebra breaking out of the geometric cage in which it had previously been locked. So I think this is a good point to pause and sum up where we have reached. Degree one equation, linear. Ax plus b equals zero, a solution is that. And I do an example, which I hope I have got correct. Then, degree two equation. Again, the solution is of the form involving the four arithmetical operations and taking the square root. And then again, I think that's the one I did earlier, so hopefully it is still correct. Degree three equation. Boy. Note, it involves the arithmetic operations. Well, note first of all how awful it is. Um, involves the arithmetical operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division in the coefficients. It involves taking square roots. It involves raising to the cube to the power of three. It involves taking cube roots. And you do all of that to get the root of the cubic. Degree four equation, the quartic, for the highest degree is four. Well, you've been very good, so I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> because it wouldn't really add very much. And I'll tell you the real reason I couldn't get it onto the screen. <laughs> Without it being too small to be meaningful. But, trust me, it involves the arithmetical operations and taking roots applied to the equation. but I've been shielding you from something. These formulae could give rise to the square root of minus one, which appears nonsensical and mysterious, as no ordinary number can be the square root of minus one. This is because the square of any number is never negative. The square root of minus one came to be called complex or imaginary, and for many centuries they were regarded with suspicion. And here, let me do a quadratic in which we see that we're, the formula will lead us down to getting the square root of minus 15 in this case. Now, that particular quadratic on the screen, and that's just applying the formula uh, to the coefficients a equals 1, b equals minus 10, and c equals 40, and the, that is the result. And the quadratic on the screen arose from a numerical problem that Cardano tried to solve. It was... Divide 10 into two parts whose product is 40. And he came up with, applying his techniques, 5 plus the square root of minus 15, 5 minus the square root of minus 15. And I think one has to admire him, because he writes, Nevertheless, we will operate, putting aside the mental tortures involved. 
So he adds together 5 plus the square root of minus 15 plus 5 minus the square root of minus 15 and the square roots cancel out. You get 10. And then you multiply them together and the terms involving the square roots again cancel and you end up with 40. And I love this quote that he have next. So progresses arithmetic's arithmetic subtlety. So progresses arithmetic subtlety. The end of which is as refined as it is useless. <laughs> and I'm not a model for those wanting to engage in mathematics. Cardano wasn't the only person to find um, complex or imaginary numbers mysterious. Euler, the great Euler, the great mathematician Euler, wrote, of such numbers we may truly assert that they are neither nothing, nor greater than nothing, nor less than nothing, which necessarily constitutes them imaginary or impossible. And the 19th century, Augustus de Morgan, professor of mathematics at University College London, declared that we have shown the symbol, the square root of minus one, to be void of meaning, or rather self-contradictory and absurd. And of course, having set them up and shown that they're so mysterious, I actually want to turn that in his head and show you that they're all, they're all quite reasonable, or rather can be reasonably viewed. And it's due to brilliant insight by the Irish mathematician William Rowan Hamilton. And let me just try to motivate it a little bit. I've hopefully convinced you that a complex number can't be an ordinary number that you know and love. Um, because any negative number, the square root of minus one, any, any number when squared has to give you a non-negative answer. So it can't be one of those. It'll have to be something more sophisticated. So what William Rowan Hamilton did in this flash of insight was to say, that's just reinforcing that, define a complex number as a pair A and B of real numbers. And this is quite an insight. There's nothing mysterious about this. It's saying a complex number is going to be a pair of real numbers, A, B. A and B are real numbers, a pair of them, nothing mysterious, nothing magical about that there. But what you say is, how do you add them? How do you multiply them? And you add them, I think, in a fairly reasonable sort of way. You add the first number of the first pair to the first number of the second pair, the second number of the first pair to the second number of the second pair, and hopefully I've done that accurately. But the rule for multiplying them is a little more sophisticated. The pair AB multiplied by the pair CD is equal to the pair, first term of which is AC minus BD, and second is AD plus BC. So if we do it with 1, 2, the pair 1, 2 multiplied by the pair 3, 4, I hope I've got that right, it's 1 times 3, and the first number for the answer, minus 2 times 4, 3 minus 8, and then for the second pair, what is it there, it's AD plus BC, the two outside ones, um, 1 times 4, and the two inner ones, 2 times 3, as I used to be taught, giving you minus 5, 10. All right, you say, this is fantastical, but what's it got to do with what we know about? What's it got to do with, for example, real numbers? Well, the association, the correspondence is straightforward. The pair A0, A in the first position, 0 in the other one, that corresponds to the real number A. And the pair 0, 1 corresponds to the imaginary number I. Now, what do I mean by corresponds to the imaginary number i? The defining property of i is that when you multiply it by itself, you get minus 1. That's what it is. Right? So what we need to do is to see that if we use the rule of multiplying 0, 1 by itself, 0, 1, we'll come up with what? Minus 1, 0. Because that's the rule for i. So we're associating, we're saying that 0, 1 behaves like the number i. When multiplied by itself, it gives you minus 1. And after that build-up, you have to believe it's going to be true. Then 0, 1 times 0, 1, when you do the multiplication, you end up with minus 1, 0. So what I'm saying with 
For example, if you associate the real number five is associated with five zero. The real number six was six zero, the real number minus one was minus one zero. So here we've got this pair of real numbers, zero one, behaves exactly like the number i. When multiplied by itself, it gives you minus one. So we've got a way of thinking of complex numbers, but in no more mysterious way than just being a pair of real numbers. The complex number is just a pair of real numbers, which we can denote using the symbol i if we so wish. And let me give you another interpretation of it, which is quite a useful one, representing complex numbers geometrically attributed to various people. And in this representation, called the complex plane, two axes are drawn at right angles, the real axis and the imaginary axis. And the complex number a plus b root minus 1 is represented by a point at a distance a in the direction of the real axis, and which is going horizontally, and b in the direction of the imaginary axis, which is going vertically. So that we've got a way of associating each complex number with a pair of real numbers, with a point on the plane, but remember we've got our rules for adding and multiplying them. That's the core. Rules for adding and multiplying them. All right. So, so far I've been talking about the quest to find a formula for the roots of a polynomial. But again, I've hidden something from, from you. It overlooks one crucial question. How do we know that every polynomial has a root? We want to find a formula for it, but it'd be reassuring to know that every polynomial equation had a root. And this is called the fundamental theorem of algebra, I'll state it in a moment. But now that I've introduced complex numbers, that was why I did that, we're now in a position to, to, to answer that. So let's look first of all at the case of odd degree polynomials. So the question is, how do we know every polynomial has roots, or, or uh, what turns out to be equivalent has a root? And let's look at odd degree equations. And it's a lovely argument here. The one I'm going to give, it needs a little bit of, of tightening up. Um, so the core thing to notice here, as x becomes big and positive, going out towards the right-hand side here, the highest degree term, x to the fifth, raising something to the power of five, it's going to swamp all of the other terms. It's going to become so much bigger, all of the other terms. It's going to be positive so that the graph is going to go way up like so. The polynomial has become very large and very positive. On the other hand, if x becomes large and negative, so x moves out here, if you have a negative number raised to the power of 5, it is going to be negative, but raising to the power of 5 becomes very, very big, and it's going to swamp all of the other terms, so that the graph out here is going to go down to become a large negative number. So we've got one kind of behaviour out to the right. The value of the polynomial is positive, large and positive. And down here to the left, the value of the polynomial is negative. And then what you argue is so that if it's going from a negative number to a positive number, it has to pass through zero somewhere in between. So there has to be a solution of any odd degree polynomial. Now, you have to fill in some of the details there, a lot of the details done by Bolzano and Cauchy, a theorem called the Intermediate Value Theorem, which says that for a polynomial, if it's negative in one place, positive in the other, then it has to be zero in between the two. It has to take any value in between those. So we now know that every odd degree polynomial has a root. Let's look at the even degree and here, my graphing package has done x to the 6th minus 10x cubed plus 40. And it worked for odd degree. Let's try the same argument for even degree. When x becomes large and positive, when x moves out here, you look at the polynomial. x to the 6th is going to swamp everything else. It's the highest, it's the degree of the equation. So that the value of the polynomial is going to go up. It's going to become large and positive. Now let's try the thing on the other side. When x becomes large and negative, and the unfortunate thing, well, not the unfortunate thing, the thing is that a negative number raised to the power of 6 is positive. Any negative number, 
a negative number raised to an even power is always positive. So that out here, as x becomes negative, certainly this term again is going to swamp the polynomial, but it's going to be positive this time. So it goes off here, oh dear, uh, that way, yep, um, goes off to positive when we increase x and also positive when we make x enlarge or negative. And as for this example here, it will meander about in here, but needn't cross the axes. So the argument is not going to work for even degree polynomials. But we've got a way out of it if we allow x to be a complex number. So that's saying that there's no real solution to this equation. But suppose we allow x to be a complex number, and I won't say very much more than just the following couple of sentences. We can make a similar technique work. This time it's a complex number, and where do they live? They live in the plane. Complex numbers live in the complex plane. I said two or three slides back ago. And what we do is we look at the behaviour of the polynomial when you go round a little tiny circle about zero and it has one kind of behaviour. And you look at the behaviour of the polynomial when you go a big circle around zero and it has another kind of behaviour. And exactly the same argument will then apply. It's got one kind of behaviour when you're very close to zero one kind of behaviour when you're far away, and in between it will have to pass through zero. The argument is the same in character, but I won't um, give you the details of it, because you, if anybody wants to come up and talk about it more afterwards, I can do that. So once again, we show that a root exists, this time it's a complex number. And therefore, let me show you the fundamental theorem of algebra in the form that Gauss proved it in his doctoral thesis, that every polynomial factorises completely into linear and quadratic factors. And here I've chosen one that was easy to do, x to the fourth minus one, and it can be given out as a quadratic factor here, now that, and as two linear factors, x minus one, x plus one. So you can see that the solutions of this are given by getting the solutions of x plus one equal to zero, which is minus one, x minus one equals zero, which is plus 1, and x squared plus 1 equals 0, which is plus or minus i. So that this allows you to conclude that the polynomial has in fact n roots. So another way of putting it is that every polynomial equation of degree n has n complex solutions. Okay. All right. So let's finish the story. So that's what the problem is. Find a formula in terms of the coefficients using only arithmetical operations as well as taking the roots. Now, first of all, I should say to you, it doesn't seem an unreasonable request because, after all, this equation is formed from raising x to the powers, adding things together, multiplying things. You could even have some divisions in there if you so wished. So what you're saying is that's how you get to x. Can you not recover it? by undoing all of those things, by adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and taking roots. And as I say, we're going to be disappointed. And it remained open until the 19th century when it was shown impossible by Niels-Henrik Abel and Everest Galois. And their stories are depressingly similar and quite tragic. Uh, look at the age at which they died. Both found it difficult to get the results accepted, although both made major advances in the theory of equations. Abel proved that no general solution can exist for polynomial equations of degree five or more, while Galois determined when such equations can be solved. Both died young, Abel from tuberculosis and Galois as a result of a duel. Growing up in Norway, Abel was desperate to study in the main centres of mathematical life in France and Germany eventually able to obtain financial support that enabled him to spend time in Paris and Berlin. In Germany, he met Leopold Krell and published many papers and early issues in his new journal, helping it to become the leading German mathematical periodical in the 19th century. And it was there that he published his proof of the impossibility for solving the general equation of degree five or more. And that was published in 1826, Published in 1826, yeah, 
over the top of it. Uh, two days later, well, sorry, where are we? Um, he also obtained fundamental results on other topics. The story of his attempt to be recognised by the mathematical community and his lack of success is a sorry one. He returned to Norway, where he contracted tuberculosis and died at the early age of 26. And as it would happen, two days later, a letter arrived at his home offering a professorship in Berlin. The work of Abel in earlier mathematicians and the unsolvability of the general quintic was developed by the brilliant Everest Galois. Galois's teenage years were traumatic. He failed his entrance examination for the École Polytechnique. A manuscript that he sent to the French Academy of Sciences was misled. Another was rejected for being obscure and his father committed suicide. A Republican firebrand, he became involved in political activities and uh, he was discovered carrying weapons at one point and wearing the uniform of a banned military organisation whereupon he was thrown into jail. He spent the night before his duel frantically scribbling a letter to his friend August Chevalier summarising his results and requesting Chevalier to show them to Gauss and Jacobi. I think it's Robin Wilson who says he might have been better getting a good night's sleep to prepare for the duel. But then we wouldn't have had Galba theory. But it was to be several years before anyone appreciated what they meant and what a genius the world had lost. And he considered a more refined question. We now know there's, one, there's no formula that does them all. There's no one formula, as for the quadratic one that solves every quadratic one. There's none that does them all. But we can ask a more refined question. Given a particular equation with numerical coefficients, is there a solution in terms of radicals? And I've stated that again. Sometimes the answer is yes. The one that I've written down there, for those of you who may know it, um, the answer is yes, because most of the terms on the left-hand side are x plus 1 to the power of 5. And sometimes the answer is no as with the one that's written down there. How do we tell them apart? It's a more refined question between the two. Right. So how do we distinguish equations that are soluble by radicals from those that are not? And Galois determined criteria in terms of an object now called the Galois group for deciding which polynomial equations can be solved by arithmetical operations and the taking of roots. And his work ultimately led to whole new areas of algebra, now known as group theory and Galois theory, and still being worked on. And I think it's probably the case, if you look at his life and look at his papers, that he did this, our sixth formers, when he was 18. So high things are expected. Crucial to the work of Abel and Galois was the notion of permutations and the structures that they could have. And following their work, powerful techniques in algebra were developed. Uh, algebra changed dramatically throughout the 19th century. In 1800, the subject was about solving equations, but by 1900, it had become the study of mathematical structures, sets of elements that are combined according to specific rules called axioms. And we saw a glimpse of that when they approached the definition of complex numbers, where Rowan Hamilton removed the mystique concerning complex numbers by defining them as pairs of real numbers with certain operations. Other algebraic structures were discovered. Hamilton introduced the algebra of quaternions. George Boole created an algebra for use in logic and probability called Boolean algebra. Cayley studied the algebra of rectangular arrays of symbols called matrices. So some of these developments in modern algebra will be in my lecture series next academic year. Thank you, and I leave you with a date for your diary, a Christmas treat on Tuesday the 11th of December, when I will talk about from one to many geometries. Thank you. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.